AT, we're back. It is game week. First week of 2017. There is 8, 9, 10, 11 games coming up in February 1st. Um, all the weather people out there are probably all jacked. But here's the deal. You can't be more excited to start the season for February 4th. And to be honest, actually, that's not even the first game. We've got Vermont and Furman coming up on Thursday night. Uh, so that'll be an interesting tilt. But in the end, we've got uh, a bunch of games this weekend. We're going to talk about all of them. But for the new show, we've got... Uh, we're just basically going to go through the top 20 each week. Uh, we're going to talk about it, and we're going to get about, say, about a 20-minute podcast for about four days a week. Then we're going to do a live show on a Saturday morning, uh, and we're going to make our picks. And we're going to bring guys on, uh, alums, guests, special guests, to make their picks with us. Again, that'll be another 20, 30-minute show. So we're going to shorten things up, but you're going to get us every day. So uh, pretty excited about that. Uh, in other news, AT. The New England Patriots are going to the Super Bowl again. They are. They are. You know, look, I, I said I was down in Florida, you know, two weeks ago at that NLF event, and I was calling that it was going to be the Falcons versus the Steelers. And I still think <laughs> that the Steelers would have won that game if Le'Veon Bell had smoked enough pot. No, I'm sorry. If he hadn't gotten hurt <laughs> earlier in the game. And uh you know, but listen, you got to hand it to the Patriots. It just seems like they just are destined to win. It's it's just it's just an unbelievable run between Brady and Belichick. But what I didn't realize is they have the number one scoring defense in yes. the league to go with their offense, the best play caller, the best quarterback. But you look at the Falcons and you see how athletic they are, how fast they scary. are. Scary, scary. You know. But you just have this feeling that somehow Belichick is going to eliminate Julio Jones from the game and make them, you know, a more one-dimensional team. And you know, but you got, but you got the, you got the two, you got the two-man power backs between Coleman and Freeman, and then you've got the kid Sanu, who's just as good. As I mean, Julio Jones is a special. He's a freak, but I, I was. Good, but he's really good. He's very good. But it, it, the the thing that I was impressed with the last game was how I mean, I really think that Antonio Brown is the most uncoverable human, other than Russell Russell Westbrook and Antonio Brown are on a whole different planet when it comes to athleticism. Yep. Uh, and LeBron, you put LeBron James in there, but I, I don't like think Russell Westbrook cover Antonio Brown. <laughs> <laughs> that would be incredible. I, I would, think he'd lock him up. I, I think he'd lock him up. I think Russell Westbrook, and say that five times fast, it's impossible, but he must be the best athlete on the planet right now. He's got to be. And if not, he's got the greatest heart, and he is just <laughs> unbelievable. I just uh, love how edgy, competitive he is. He is. He is. Um, I, I do too. And I like his – he also gets it. Like he understands life. And like his post game responses to some people are incredible, uh, but I do I I do like it's all ownership. I just what I love about him is it's all ownership, all the time. It is. You know, there's nothing soft about Russell Westbrook's approach, to, <laughs> and it's just Russell Westbrook. Everyone yeah. wants to do it, Russell. Whatever it is, he's got unreal, unrealistically high expectations for himself all the time. And it is just so refreshing in a sport where they usually, uh, you know, it's almost like he has a hockey player's mentality. It's interesting. In NBA basketball. That's really interesting. Is there anyone, are there any other basketball players that have that in today's no, NBA saying, game? I don't think there's many athletes, That's uh, fair. you know, that just generally speaking, you take, you know, all the sports. Hockey, pro hockey players seem to me like the only ones that truly are not interested in tooting their own horn in any way. They're, they they just seem 100% out for their teammates in the way that they play and the way that they deflect adulation and the way that they take on criticism. It's just, it, it really fair. should be the template for how all professional athletes act. They're also the only sport in any major competitive sport that literally when they're born all they think about is winning the stanley cup 
Like right. when they, when you're a born hockey player, and it's it, like it's not the same thing as a football player. You know, a Lombardi Trophy is a big deal. No, get me wrong, but it's not. The kids don't wake up, you know, throwing a touchdown pass to win the Lombardi Trophy. It doesn't. That doesn't work. Like I don't sure. even know what the NBA Trophy is. Like you don't hit, you know, a three two one buzzer beater in the back of your house to win the Davis Trophy, whatever that is. You don't do that, but you do shoot a hockey puck into a net and everyone celebrates and they win the Stanley cup. Like that's just, it's just ingrained in those kids. Um, and it's cool that, um, you know, it is, what it's, it about, is. it's about dunking in basketball. It's <laughs> about it a, getting a home run in baseball, right? It's about scoring a touchdown in football and it's about winning the Stanley cup in hockey. That's right. right. That's right. That's right. That's well, Let's go on to the games. We've got two games we're going to cover today. And for you, it was about like being a member of you know a winning Davis Cup team in Davis tennis. Cup. <laughs> is that what it is? Cup. Davis Cup. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you and Tom Sandoval from Vanderpump Rules. You guys are match made in heaven. Oh, is it? Well, I in golf is it the Masters? I think uh, golf is getting a hole in one. No, is it the Masters though? Like, or is it? Or is it? I don't I think mean, it's, it's a home probably, one. It's probably home one's master, unrealistic. But it should be the U.S. Open, in my opinion. Fair enough. Fair enough. But we, I'm like a you know 18-6 handicap, so. <laughs> Eighteen hundred and six handicap. Ish. <laughs> All right, let's get into the games. We got CSU versus Michigan. We're going to cover four game or two games today. We're going to cover two tomorrow. BU and Providence and UNC and UMBC. We're going to cover tomorrow. We're going to look exactly the same though tomorrow. So he's going to wear the same outfit and the same hat. I'm going to wear the same hat and the same sweatshirt and we're going to cover it all tomorrow morning exactly the same time. So let's talk a little bit about Michigan versus CSU. CSU, first program game, history of the program. Michigan, this is team six. AT, talk to me about Michigan. So Michigan, we've, we've talked about a little bit more on the podcast. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of JP's and I'm a huge fan of Michigan in general. I, I really want to see this program uh, start to soar in 2017. And I think they'd be the first to tell you that they were disappointed coming off of 2016 with a three and 10 record overall, 0 and five in the league in JP's fifth year. Uh, you know, you look at their offense, they were scoring 9.3 goals a game, shooting 28% and they lose you know, their their best offensive player in Kyle Jackson. And along with him, you know, they lose his 29 goals, six assists. They also lose Peter Krause, a new Canaan native. Yes. Yes, Peter. Peter Krause is a Ram. Peter. 40 Gs and four, uh, four, 20 Gs and four assists. But they return Ian King. And Score. they return midfielder Decker Curran. Um, Ian King, you know, sort of returns as their main playmaker with 13 goals and 19 assists. Decker Curran, a Greenwich kid, stud. I saw him play in high school. 10 goals, five assists. I think you look at this team and you know that they've assembled some great talent of which you're responsible for. I think they need more from Mike Slosher on the offensive end. He only had five goals and two assists last year. And P.J. Vogel is another guy that I remember was one of the best high school players in the country coming out. So, you know, that's that's their offense, basically, their defense. Listen, this team defense has given up 12.77 goals a game in 2016. They need to fix that. Uh, they got to hope that returning veterans, Andrew Hatton, Charlie Cady. Andrew Hatton, kid, another Connecticut kid. Yep. Yeah, and Charlie Cady, too. Fair oh, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, and Stefan Bergman, I know, got some starts last year for them. You, you got to hope that they're able to come together as a group and shore up that end of the field. Because if they continue to give up over 12 and a half goals a game, they're going to continue to struggle record-wise. No question about it. They lose Lott, who was their stud face-off guy. Uh, the best returning guy they have is Mike McDonald, who didn't take many draws and finished the year at just under 50 percent. Um, and they, who's the stud that you brought in from Philly, Della Rocca, or what's his name? Uh, uh, Della Cruz. Yeah, he's a stud. So maybe he ends up being their guy uh, over the course of the year. It wouldn't be that surprising. And he's going to have to win 48 percent or he's going to have to do better than 48 percent for these guys. Um, to take the pressure off of their defense. You look at their goaltending situation, you know, obviously they lose their 2016 starter in Gerald Logan, who we all feel is uh, one of the very best goaltenders in the country. But again, Connecticut native, Tommy Height. <laughs> That's uh, right. Brunswick School, he's scheduled to take over for them. And he's a stud. I mean, I think that while he's untested, 
I, I do think that he is a stud, and I think that they are going to be pleasantly surprised by the play that they get in the goal out of Tommy Height. Um, you know, beyond that, their special teams man up was 33% last year. Man down was 62%. If they simply maintain that, have the same number of penalties, um, you know, that's pretty much a wash. But that's that's what I've got, you know, just in terms of Michigan going into 2017. Interesting. It's very interesting to see um, how Michigan obviously is going to play out this year. On the other half, you've got a team that, was Michigan six years ago, but a little different than what Michigan was um, since Michigan took on their entire club team. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Dylan Sheridan going into his first ever uh, program game, uh, and he had a lot of cool things to say. I mean, look, I mean, winning is obviously the major goal. They want to win, but the reality is is you got a bunch of freshmen, uh, and this is a lineup – of exclusively freshmen. They've got no upperclassmen on the program. Um, and so you're literally building a culture from bottom up. Uh, and that's exciting for a coach because you've got no other, uh, you're basically starting blank slate. Um, and I think that in terms of what he was talking about, the keys to the weekend is just to really kind of embrace the opportunity. It's the biggest game of their careers. They're all going to more or less make an impact at some point of the game. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really for him to kind of figure out what his lineup is going to look like, uh, come in 2017. I mean, look, he's got a situation at the X, um, you know, he's, he says the, the goalie situation is very fluid, which basically means in coaches speak, everything's up for grabs and it's a very competitive environment. Obviously he's creating in Cleveland. Um, so it's really good to see that. I mean, he, the biggest thing that he mentioned, um, in his talk with me about the program was that we are a nameless team. That's what he said. And, and, and I don't think it's necessarily nameless in terms of Cleveland State. I think they've done a great job of putting themselves on the map um, and getting themselves out there to recruits in terms of knowing who they are. But nameless in a sense that um, they don't have any identity on the field yet. And they don't have any superstars right now. And so this is a great opportunity for any young player to kind of cement themselves as a leader in the program and somebody that can end up making an impact over the course of the year and assert themselves as a leader. Uh, and I think that any time that you are creating a new program, leadership is the number one. Obviously, culture and leadership are the number one things that you need uh, in order to be successful. Uh, and so that's where I think that Dylan um, is going to focus on this year. In terms of going up against Michigan, you got to look at the same things that you were talking about, which are, you know, they lost their goalie. So there's a little opportunity there in terms of maybe taking advantage of, you know, fresh blood in cage. Uh, is it going to be uh, Tommy Height or is it going to be the young man from Missouri? Uh, that should be interesting. Trowbridge. Trowbridge. Um, he's a stud. Too. He's a stud. Um, and so is that the case? Exactly what you said. Is a freshman going to start the faceoff X? Uh, who knows? But this should be a pretty good test to at least for Dylan to figure out, you know, what his team looks like under pressure and in the limelight because that's exactly what we're going to get going into the Glick or Oosterbahn. I'm, I'm not sure if they're in the Glick or Oosterbahn. I'm pretty sure they're in Oosterbahn uh, for this tilt. Uh, but – Still exciting to see a new team take the field again in 2017. Uh, the last year, was there a new team? that? Oh, Hampton last year, right? So yeah. there's been a new team to take the field uh, each of the last, what would you say, five or so years? At, at least. Yeah, I mean, at six least. probably too. Well, and then we had uh, the year prior, um, you had, uh, well, then you got the Amplo, you got Torp, uh, you got Richmond. Um, yeah, I think NJIT. It, I think they've, done, they've, they've, they've done a pretty good job of adding, you know, one or a few teams seemingly the last four or five years, right? Right, right. So let me ask you, RD, what are the keys to Cleveland State winning this game? What does Cleveland State have to do to win the game? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, let's face it. If this was the is end of the season, if this was the end of the season, I think this is a great opportunity to potentially get that win, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I, you know, 
who knows what kind of a Michigan team that's going to show up on game day. Uh, I mean, we've talked about this a lot on, on the podcast, but uh, in the end, uh, this is the first game in the career of everyone. Dylan Sharon as a head coach and every single kid on that team. I just don't see uh, a way to do it, but if they do have the opportunity to do it, then uh, it's getting tons of shots on cage. Test the goalie early because you're indoors and it's not very easy to see in Usbron. But then again, you put yourself right in the hands of what Michigan's wheelhouse is, is playing indoors. And that we've talked about this on the podcast a thousand times. You go into Q's, you go into Notre Dame's indoor facility, you go into Penn State's indoor facility, you go to Michigan's indoor facility, you go to anyone's indoor facility, you're immediately five goals down off the bus, right? Um, and so, Unless you're playing in Cornell, then you're eight goals. <laughs> then you're eight goals, and it's outdoors. It's not even oh. indoors. <laughs> um, so, look, this is going to be a challenge for uh, Cleveland. But at the same time, uh, to put this thing in within, you know, three, four goals, and of course no one wants moral victories, but three, four goals uh, at the end, you know, you got a you got a head coach that's coming off of a first game with a three, four goal loss. Um, you know, that's to me, that's a little bit of a win. And, you know, you're looking back in the face of the Wolverines and wondering what's going to happen in 2017 too, right? I, I, I think Michigan, and I'll keep it quick, but, you know, I think the key for Michigan is clearly they they need to play fast. They need to get off to a good start to their season. As much as they're playing Cleveland State, I almost feel like they're playing to prove that they're a different team than the way that their 2016 te- season played out. And in order to do that, I think they have to play fast all over the field, playing fast with more energy. Their challenge, if I'm John Paul, I'm saying, listen, this isn't about Cleveland State. This is about everybody in this locker room. And the goal is to be the most energetic team on the field at all phases and if they play fast then they're going to be able to accentuate their advantage um you know at both ends of the field between the lines and i think that they'll end up getting the result that they want my concern for michigan is if they're not winning face-offs and cleveland state you know takes a page out of bill tierney's game plan when he took over princeton and i know dylan sheridan is Bill Tierney's son-in-law, right? Isn't that right? Yes, that is correct. You know, listen, if they win face-offs and they're able to slow the game down, and, you know, Michigan's lack of a proven team defense, you know, could keep this game Could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, listen, that's the way that they got to do it, I think, in this game. And, you know, certainly he'll have the blueprint based on, you know, what Coach Tierney was able to do in the early years of him at Princeton when they, you know, didn't have the amount of talent or depth that they eventually acquired and eventually got fitted for six rings in the process. So it'll be interesting <laughs> to see that. But I think Michigan wins this game handily. I wouldn't be surprised to see them win uh, by, you know, 15 goals. Same. Same. I would. I mean, you you got to figure they're going to press all over the field, and yep. you got to figure Cleveland's going to probably drop the ball a few times. So moving on, though, we got Manhattan versus Bryant. Uh, This is an interesting one. Uh, I'm excited for this one myself uh, because we got our boy. um, Drew Kelleher. Drew Kelleher, excuse me, just blacked out. No offense, Uh, press. The truth (laughs) (laughs) We got our... We got our boy, Drew Kelleher. He's coming into this after a pretty interesting or hard-fought second half of the season. They were playing a lot better down the stretch last year. But let's talk a little bit about Bryant first going into this. AT, give me your thoughts. Uh, Bryant comes off a great year in 2016, at least as it relates to their regular season. You know, they had a huge win over Brown. They had a huge win over Harvard. Uh, you know, they just didn't get it done in the playoffs. I mean, right. that really was the story for them. Uh, you know, they were 10 and five regular season, five and one in the division. They go into 2017 just out of the top 20 in the also receiving votes category. Yep. Um, you know, it's an offense that last year put up over 11 goals per game. They were shooting 28%, which is a little low, probably. Um, and they lose proven four-year stud Shane Morrell and his 30 goals and 10 assists, but they return a bunch of great players all over the field. Uh, you know, at the top of that list, certainly attackman Tucker James was 33 and 22. 
They returned midfielders Ryan Sharp at 24 and 12, Tom Forsberg 13 and 12, Tom Kennedy 14 and 5. You know, this is a this is a scary offense. There's no question about it. Uh, on the defensive end, they were only letting up 8.47 goals a game, just under eight and a half. And they returned starters Chaz South, who's a stud athlete. Uh, Anthony Johnson, Kyle Mumau, their long stick midi, Cody O'Donnell from Rhode Island is, is one of the best long stick midfielders in the college game and has been since he arrived to Bryant four years ago. He's a senior this year, uh, really, really scary in transition. Uh, they return Kevin Massa at the faceoff X, who won over 50 50 Is that kid ever going to graduate? No, it's his brother. That's his little brother. Oh, no way. No yes. way. That's Kevin the was best. the guy that never graduated. <laughs> That's awesome. His brother Kenny, who's a stud as well. Oh, I thought you said Kevin. I was like, oh, no, I can't Kenny, believe that kid's stud. He like graduated 10 years ago. That's 50, sick. 56% last year and was 3-3 three and three off the break. That is so sick. Uh, you know, the biggest loss for them is obviously they lose four-year starting goaltender Gunnar Walt, who is, you right. know, let's face it, one of the very best goaltenders in the country for his entire time up there. Um, and it appears that James Warner, who will be stepping in for them, who got virtually no minutes last year and steps into the cage with, you know, 33% save percentage, but let's face it, he, he probably only took <laughs> three shots. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that that's, that's the one question mark for this team because they do return a ton of experience all over the field. You know, their special situations man up. They were scoring 38% of the time, which is a really, really good number for man up. And they let in, uh, or their man down on was 65%. So that's somewhat of a wash with their man up being a little bit better. But uh, this is a scary team. Bryant is a very, very scary team. And let's face it, you know, had they won their conference playoff last year, we would be looking at this team probably going in ranked at 15, 16 in the country. They return the players like that. Um, and if they can get goaltending play here, this is going to be a very, very scary team again for teams to play in 2017. Uh, Manhattan, um, again, we talked about it. Look, they've got two guys uh, that are really going to kind of carry this team. You got Parker Giratana or Giratana. I That's Florida. Yes. Giratana. He was he's, rookie of the year in the Mac. He's a player, that kid. He, rookie of the year in the Mac last year with 44 points. This kid can score. He's a legitimate yeah. All American candidate in yes. his career. Um, right. And so if you got a guy that can score like that. Uh, and can put 31 goals up like he did last year, uh, y you can get things done, at least offensively. The second piece, and we always talk about important pieces to the puzzle, uh, you've got an attack. You know, they might, they're still going to develop other pieces with him. Parker can't necessarily do it himself. Um, but the other piece of the puzzle is Mike Zingaro, or Zingaro. I apologize again. I'm always screwing kids' names up, but it doesn't matter. The kid's 53% or 54% save percentage. For a kid that's going to see as much rubber as he's going to when they were 44% at the faceoff X or probably a little less, um, that's impressive. I mean, I remember doing the stats for Jerry Logan, who's probably going to end up or hopefully ends up starting for Hopkins. Um, he faced like I think it was 685 shots in a season. I mean, and he was just under 60 percent or 60 percent even. I mean, that's incredible. Um, so I think those two pieces are what's going to lead Manhattan in 2017 because um, you've got two very good positions to do that. Uh, in terms of the faceoff, they've kind of fixed it a little bit. They hope they've got a transfer from Nassau CC uh, and a name Joey Bess Bressingham. Uh, they also got a, a sophomore, Matt Carroll, who's developed a ton as well. So uh, hopefully between the two of them, they can kind of figure out how to handle and defuse Bryant this weekend because they're certainly going to need it, uh, yeah, so they can get, need it. Th so they can get the ball to Parker. I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, and in terms of, you know, managing the game uh, for Manhattan, uh, they've got to stop the kid, Tucker James. They have to do it. Um, and he's been a beast for years. Uh, they got to solve their defense. Uh, they don't like to slide. So, again, it comes back to the attack for Manhattan being able to draw, um, you know, put Bryant in an uncomfortable scenario. Uh, but in the end, you know, talking to Drew Kelleher about this before the game, I mean, I guess he, he was more frustrated last year in their ability to come ready to play. And I think that his goal this year and the team's goal is to come out swinging. Um, and I think that they started to show that a lot based on what they showed at the second half of the season. Um, but 
like any team out there, listen, if, if you can compete and execute at the highest level, you can compete any day, any day on game day. But the other part is, is amidst having a great goalie, having a great attackman, having a new face-off or a new face at the face-off, uh, they've got eight freshmen playing in significant spots. And that's, of course, a tribute to Drew building the program um, and, and, yeah. and doing what he needs to do to bring in the culture that he wants and setting the program in the right direction. But, of course, you're going to have slow starts um, with a learning curve teaching eight to ten guys who are brand new to the Division One game. Um, and so going into a game like Bryant, it's early. Uh, and you hope that a team like Manhattan might be able to jump early on them if they do what coach wants them to do, which is come out and play right away. Uh, or this could be a little bit of a runaway uh, if Bryant gets out and wins 60 plus percent of the faceoff X, uh, and, right. and then and then and then Bryant big boys can, can, on the defensive end. Can Manhattan end. win? How how pinpoint a couple of bullet points? How does Manhattan win this game? They win with five plus goals from Parker. They yep. win with 50% of the face-off X from either either or combined. And they need about 12 to 15 saves out of Mike Zingaro. I mean, that's that's it, right? I mean, you know, in terms of your turnover numbers, look, it's the beginning of the season. The turnover numbers are going to be generally high. Um, and so if you can limit that as much as possible. But I, I, when I look at the season, you know, the team that turns it over less, of course, in the beginning of the season – dictates games way earlier than later. I mean, later you can actually point to a specific turnover that determines the outcome of the game. Hopefully, um, if, you, if you get better over the course of the year. Of course, uh, of course. You know, the other side of that, I would say, um, you know, Brian won, Bryant won this game, first game of the year last year, 16-3. to Right. Now, Coach Pressler has been there for a while. He's gotten his guys. Drew Kelleher, we know, is just getting started. The fact that he's got that many freshmen – projected to play on game day is is just shows you that they made the right hire when they hired drew keller yes um you know but i think this is this is all about bryant and if bryant does what they're capable of doing if they suffocate manhattan by dominating the face-off x uh this is going to be a this is going to be a long day for manhattan you know if they if they do that they play fast all over the field pressure defense and push transition i just i just think it's going to be a struggle however as you said if, uh, you know, Zingaro has a great day in the goal and can get 15 saves and Bryant's new goaltender doesn't show up and they get five saves, this is this this could end up being a game. I mean, this could end up being a game. And I, I hope for Drew Kelleher's sake that, you know, it is. And it wouldn't surprise – it won't surprise me. This will be a closer game than 13 goals. Whether or not Manhattan has enough to win yet, I don't know. I hope so. I don't think so. But it's definitely – I don't see them losing by 13 goals in this game. I could see them losing by five goals or six goals. Um, but for them to do that, they're going to have to have some success at the faceoff X, as you said. They're going to have to win the goaltending battle, as you said. And Parker Giarantana is going to have to have his five goals, eight points, whatever it may be. That's and right. he may be able to get it. He's he's proven, but he's going to have to beat Chaz South or whoever uh, is uh, marking him on game day. So it's going to be fun to watch. It will be fun to watch. Uh, that's all we have for today's show. Uh, we're going to be back again tomorrow. We're going to discuss BU, Providence, UNC, UMBC. Uh, so bear with us. We'll be back. Maximize your comfort. Um, and thank you for the listen.